say something mathematical. So it's a bit of a challenge. We'll see how it goes. Got it. What? Uh, so it should be two talks in one. So we'll, this is why we're a bit struggling here. Um, but the first one, it will be reminiscences. And uh, I will do this in a literary fashion. I have written a text, which I will read to in the interest of time. All right. So I met John in uh, 1976. And for a few years, we worked really intensively together. And as a tribute to him, I would like to reminisce about that period, which has been a defining one for both of us. It's widely appreciated that John is a world leading figure in mathematical physics and a pillar of the Montreal community. Over the years, his many contributions in various areas have thrown important light on major questions and have much impacted fields such as gauge theories, integral systems, isomonodromic deformation, tile functions, random matrices, algebraic combinatorics, etc. I will leave it to the experts in these topics gathered for this event to remind us of the fundamental importance of John's discovery. I've decided to share memories that take us back 46 years, yes, trusting that you will take interest in hearing that in his early 30s, John's passion for discovery made him overcome circumstantial challenges with remarkable determination, and that beyond advancing collaboratively mathematical physics, he was enriching everyone, myself in particular, through his immense culture, and if uncompromising in nature, above everything, he was and has remained a much caring person. I don't know if you recognize the uh, the picture I'm showing. I took it myself in Milan. It's in it's a fragment of uh, the carton that Raphael drew for the School of Athens, which is here. This is the whole carton, and the fragment I was showing is that sorry is Euclid with its disciples. So it made me think of John and certainly my relations to him. And here's, of course, in the Vatican, the full picture of Raphael. Something on John's background. So John was born in Budapest in 1946 from parents that hid during the World War War, the Second World War War, um, uh, under false names and passports. He has one brother, Stephen, who is one year older than him. John has two, was two years old when his family immigrated to Montreal. He pursued his undergraduate. So you see him, maybe, I don't know, John, you were six or seven, something like that. And so he um, pursued his uh, undergraduate studies in physics at McGill University and lived mostly in the English speaking community of Montreal, somehow disconnected from the other solitude, except that he took part in the famous camp of the Jeunesse Musicale du Canada in the Eastern Townships and attended the Quebec Music Conservatory. More on that later. In 1968, John went to Urbana-Champagne with the intent of doing a PhD at the University of Illinois. He then changed his plan and moved to Oxford the year after with a generous Shell scholarship where he obtained a DPhil in high energy physics in 1972. He had then two supervisors. First, Roger Phillips, who was the director of the Rutherford Lab, and second, John Taylor. Interestingly, Phillips hosted Pavel Vintonitz in 1968 when Pavel left Czechoslovakia in the aftermath of the Prague Spring. In 1972, Pavel took a position at the CRM. While John did not manage to cross paths with Pavel and Ingrid, this was, this was to happen later with much consequences. I've always perceived that John was a bit disappointed that he ended doing a thesis and the declining an electricity bootstrap approach to high energy physics, which is somehow making a comeback, but rather than on gauge theories. Indeed, even though Taylor was then making seminal contributions to the latter field, John's work bore on Reggie and Lorenz Paul, albeit from a group theoretical viewpoint. Following his doctorate, John spent a year in Budapest. So you see him there in Tokai uh, at, in 72. He returned to Canada in 1973 to hold a three-year postdoctoral fellowship of the Institute for Particle Physics at Carleton University in Ottawa. 
At the time, John provided the general formulation of gauge invariant field theories based upon space-time symmetries. This aimed at generalizing in particular to the conformal group, the work of Kibble, Uchiyama, and Shiana, who attempted to interpret general rel relativity as a gauge theory of the Lorentz group. I believe this is when he learned the coordinate free formulation of differential geometry based in particular on the concept of connections and principal bundles. He would teach me that a few years later, and this has been one of the many instances where the extent of his mathematical knowledge has amazed me. In 1975 76, there were basically no job openings in theoretical energy physics, and John took a temporary CJEP professor's position at Dawson College. This was a year of public service strikes in Quebec in the context of high inflation. With the Olympics taking place in Montreal that year, the Bourassa government had eventually to back away from its initial tough stand. And in fact, in November 76, it lost power and the Iraq and the PQ won the election. During this unrest, having attended a share of union meetings and unable to be in the classroom, John started to spend time at the CRM. This became a haven for him, a place where he could connect with soulmates such as Pavel Vintonitz, Yuri Patera, and Bob Sharp, who were all interested in symmetries. Let me recall that this Olympic year was also a vibrant one in mathematical physics at the CRM as Patera and Vintonitz organized back to back two major scientific activities, the SMS Summer School, and for the first time outside of Europe, the International Colloquium and Group Theoretical Methods in Physics. Bob Sharp was a member of the physics department at McGill where, when John was an undergrad, but the two of them had somehow never met. It was Sharp who first offered John a stipend to officialize his presence at the CRM as a visiting, first, research associate. Later, Patera and Vintonitz put together funds to provide John with a longer-term research associate position at the CRM. This prompted him to resign from his CJEP job and to focus entirely on research for some years. I was born at the CRM as a PhD student at Vinternet's working on superintegrable models. I had completed my general exam and was ready to give it my own to uh, research. I do not exactly recall how John and I met. I suppose it was at a seminar. I will come to how we started to collaborate in a minute, but let me mention here that John many times expressed that he much enjoyed being on the campus of the Université de Montréal and being immersed in the French-speaking part of the city. Although he still make, makes mistakes, John was already quite fluent in French, and as a matter of fact, we have always been speaking in that language together. I remember he was living in an apartment on Burlington Street near the university. He was not making a ton of money, of course, and like many of us, was a bit bohemian, and not so preoccupied by the practical aspects of life. The following little story is a reflection of that. He had at the time an old Volvo uh, that broke down and could no longer be moved. He left it parked uh, in front of his apartment. The only problem is that every other day he was getting a parking ticket because the street side on which parking was allowed was alternating from day to day got to a point where a bailiff paid him a visit to the CRM to sort this out. Well, I will move to talk about our joint scientific work. Those were the years 76 to 80. And you see John with his daughter, I think this is in 79. The late 60s and 70s were certainly fascinating times in theoretical physics. Let me remind you of the advent of the weinberg model in 67, 68, unifying the electroweak interactions with the help of Higgs bosons, the proof of renormalizability by Tuft and Vatman in 71, and the development of quantum chromodynamics, QCD by Gross, Wilczek, and Pulitzer in 73. All these discoveries were recognized with Nobel Prizes. Quite remarkably, in a short period of six years or so, the standard model of particle physics based on gauge theories was developed by incorporating notions like spontaneous symmetry breaking and anomalies and so on. This reestablished quantum field theory as the leading theoretical framework and opened the exploration of new ideas such as extra dimensions or supersymmetry within that realm. I was curious about these striking advances, and this interest was finding resonance with John, who suggested that we run a gay seminar in the CR. The importance of non-perturbative 
analysis in classical silicon-like solutions with topological properties such as magnetic nanopoles and instantons was being revealed at the time. The theory division of the Canadian Association of Physicists was organizing summer schools in Banff in those days. By the way, this would give me later the idea of creating the CRM school in Banff that was eventually replaced by Burst. In any case, I attended that school in 77, where Roman Jakiv delivered lectures on classical solutions of Yangman's equation. Now, the first project John completed at the CRM aimed to parameterize tensor fields that are invariant under subgroups of the conformal group of space-time. The results were reported in a paper written in collaboration with Jules Becas, a colleague from Liège, Belgium, Marcel Perroux, and Pavel Ventonitz. Marcel Perroux was a member of the MathFIS group at the CRM, who had obtained a position at the Polytechnic Moral Theorist Thesis. We were close to him, and he helped John find an appointment at some point. I shall return to that. Having performed that study, John had the idea of applying the approach to Gates field with a view of using the results and symmetry reduction of the young mills equation in Minkowski space. He thus proposed that we pursue this project, and it was, great, it was with great enthusiasm that I joined it. The plan was so good that others also thought of it and beat us up with the first results. Indeed, the solutions invariant under the O4 subgroup of the conformal group were fairly easy to obtain and new share as well as Schechter scooped us with them. We rolled up our sleeves higher and could obtain a much broader family of solutions that are invariant under a U2 subgroup. I recall having pages and pages of computation that John could wisely simplify using more cartoon forms. And this led to, our, to a joint paper in first led B, my first in 78. It was then at John's initiative that Steve and Schneider started collaborating with us. It is from John that I best learned the merits of openness, sharing ideas, and of seeking friends to discuss and work with. It was great to rub shoulders with a true, with a true mathematician who could straddle abstract consideration and dirty computation. I also recall how John similarly introduced me to Jacques Etzubis when he returned from Oxford. With Steve, we wrote a paper published in JMAT Fields in 79, in which we provided the solution to the self zero angles equation that are SU2 instead of U2 invariant. Incidentally, the topic was hot, and some of our results were obtained independently by others, in particular Howe and Tucker, roughly at the same time. With the two, these two papers, my, my thesis was well underway, and John de facto became my supervisor, and a very dedicated one with the kind of, agree, with the kind of agreement of Vinternitz, my official supervisor. For some time, the construction of the most general instantan was a challenge. In 1977, the TN world indicated that this problem could in principle be solved via algebraic geometry. They pointed out that through the use of the Penrose twister approach to space time, the solution of the self ewing Mills equation can be converted into complex analytic bundles and projective tree space. The explicit description of instantons is thus translated into the classification of these complex analytic objects that have, that have been achieved by then. Steve Schneider received an invitation to participate in a workshop in complex manifold techniques and theoretical physics organized by David Lerner and Paul Summers in Lawrence, Kansas in July 78. Steve suggested that John and I join. I recall traveling on the flying colors just of the United States, the alias for Brennan Airlines, for those who have that, the age to remember that, that was to seize its operation in 82 because of the deregulation of the airline industry. Steve presented our results. Richard Ward was among the lecturers. This was also the first occasion for us all to meet the young Ed Witten and for me to cross paths with Roman Jacky the second time. This workshop made quite an impression on John. It definitely can do his interest in twisters, which he started to lecture on, and that he made good use of at some point in the studies with Steve and others of the supersymmetric Yang Mills equation. Coming back to our work on invariant solutions to the Yang Mills equation, there's relevant to mention two papers that influenced us. One is by, Roman, by Jakiv and Rebbe, where the conformal O5 invariance of the PPST1 instanton solution is identified. And the second by Witten, where a multi instanton solution is obtained through dimensional reduction under O3 of the self dual Yang Mills equation to an Higgs model in curved two dimensional space. An essential feature of these studies is the fact that the variance of the Yang Mills fields under the space time transformations 
is compensated by gauge transformation. This was the case also for the solutions we had found. John, Steve, and I just undertook the task of providing a general mm -hmm. constructive description of gauge fields that are invariant in that sense and the group of space-time transformation. We address the question of global formalism of fiber bundle theory. More precisely, we classified lifts of certain group action on manifolds to principal bundles over these bases and characterized the invariant connections under these lifted actions. In the ac academic uh, year 78 79, I accompanied Vintonitz to Paris, where he went on sabbatical. This provided many opportunities. But the relevance to my story about John is the fact that at the invitation of Alexander Strasberger, I spent an extended period of time in Warsaw, which John had also done. This arose from the fact that Oleg, you see uh, Polish colleagues, but Oleg is the guy here in the picture with Michel Gourdin, who's just there. Um, so Oleg had visited the CRM for a while and that John and I had befriended with him. Our work on group action and principal bundling and advanced conditions for gauge field was nearly completed at the time. And while still in Europe, I could make a presentation of it at the uh, International ICMP, the National Congress of Mathematical Physics that was held in Lausanne that year in a session that was organized by Andre Trotman, the fellow at the far left end for you also with John. Once I got back to, to Montreal, the paper was finalized and submitted, and this led to what is still today John's most cited article. Before you go on, I'm in the middle of the Bible Robbins. Yes, also a distinguished uh, person. <clears throat> uh, so I didn't get busy with uh, wrapping up my thesis. I had to make plans for what I would do afterwards and part and in particular, I had to make applications for postdoctoral fellowships during that fall. You have to appreciate that John was himself in a rather precarious, non-permanent academic situation. Nonetheless, with enormous altruism and attention, he much cared about my future. Then John thought that joining uh, Jakeev's vibrant research group at MIT would be terrific. In view of my enthusiasm, John was quick to invite Roman to Montreal for a scientific visit, so that I could explore the matter with him. This worked great, with Roman agreeing to support my position at MIT. Identifying my external examiners, also something into John uh, got involved, and it was Peter Freund from Chicago who was asked to play that role. And I just defended my thesis in the summer of 18, and mm -hmm. shortly after moved to the Boston. I, I know. Together with Jacek Tafel, John and Steve applied our results on invariant gauge fields to show how Higgs fields ah, could be for reduction of pure diagnosed dynamics. This reduction by symmetry methods has recurred in John's work, and he often likes to offer a pedagogical explanation of this phenomenon using Plato's parable of the cave, another reason for evoking Raphael's School of Athens fresco. Now, at the time, Pavel had also returned from his sabbatical. I recall he had resolved to direct his efforts to integrable systems, and for a number of years, he and John worked together on this. In this context, John did for Ivan saint aubain an outstanding doctoral student and friend, two years my junior, so he did what he had done for me by bringing him and his collaboration with Stephen Schneider. Under the inspired leadership of John, these three Berlin fellows have produced a remarkable series of papers that discusses the background transformation for sigma models within the Zakharov Shabbat dressing method based on the matrix Riemann Hilbert problems. This formed the bulk of Ivan's thesis, who also did his postdoctoral fellowship at MIT. What John did for Ivan and I, he generously and enthusiastically did for many others who could tell stories similar to mine. Like for the others, I'm sure, he had on me a fundamental scientific influence. He oriented me towards thriving fields. He offered a role model, he offered as a role model someone with good taste, tremendous creativity and drive. And above all, he showed me to aim high. I'm deeply in debt for that, and I try to apply this lesson with my own students. And as if this was not enough, his precious friendship gave me much more. And I will turn to that now and the cultural enrichment I owe John. 
During the years I'm focusing on, John and I were together a lot and would take breaks from physics and math from time to time to redo the world. Uncertain about our future, we entertained for fun the thought of opening a restaurant on Edouard Monti where patrons could linger and indulge in serious and frivolous discussions like us. We also enjoyed outdoor activities. Uh, as you can see, um, did the number of hikes in beautiful space, places in the Adirondacks and the Rockies, in particular, and for a while, played tennis regularly. These days are a bit gone. Uh, so you recognize John, of course, and it's Yvon Saint Aubin with, with my wife. Uh, this, however, would always take, take us back to these activities to some of our favorite topics literature, music, and fine arts, if I exclude politics and science. I mean, here and there, allusion to music. Most of you are probably aware that John is an accomplished oboist. The physical ex exigencies of the instrument are such that I think John no, no longer plays it now. Over the years, there were periods where he resumed training and gave concerts, some of which I had the chance to attend. And here you see the man in action. The group there is a Baroque group in Princeton. Um, so a graduate from, as I said, from the Quebec Music Conservatory he appreciates music with the mind, the heart, and the knowledge of the technical challenges. We attended many recitals um, and performances together. I remember, for instance, just to remind John, for example, driving to my bank to listen to the extraordinary violinist Henrik Zelig, whom John had been in contact with at the Jeunesse Musicale Camp in Oxford, in Orford. There were many other such outings, each occasion to hear John express his learn views on the pieces and the performances. I may mention that we are both subscribers to a chamber music series and that we were in the concert hall together yesterday. I had the opportunities to visit major museum with John. Often this made me discover masterpieces for the first time in his company. To this day, whenever I see these paintings again, I typically remember the historical and aesthetical commentaries of John that are forever part of my appreciations of various periods of art history. I will now recall uh, one of our adventures to bring up episodes that have artistic and humorous connotation. The year is 1981. John and I are invited by Jean-Pierre Antoine as visiting professors to deliver independent courses at the Université Catholique de Louvain early in the summer. John came up with the idea that we should take a trip to Hungary once we had completed our lectures, we arranged for Alex Strasberger and his family to meet us in Hungary. Before I get to that trip, let me tell you about two excursions we made over weekends. One was to Ghent and Bruges, where I could not have a better companion than John to discover the Flemish primitives and notably the adoration of the mystic lamb of the Van Eyck brothers. The other was to Amsterdam, the first time in his city for both of us. Now, being of a compulsive nature myself, I wish to methodologically follow the Michelin guide. John, less conventional and more free mind, had bought to, uh, another guide and wanted to use it to retrace the life of Schopenhauer in the Jewish ghetto. This is a rare instance when we. It was Schopenhauer. No? Speed was up. Uh, my, my, I stand corrected. You see, it's always. Uh, I, was, I didn't go there, though. Uh, uh, so Spinoza. Now, uh, this is one uh, rare occasion where we parted ways. And uh, the, the, if there's a lesson, we, we had agreed to meet back for dinner. And if there's a lesson, trust the Michelin guy. Because John came back utterly disappointed, not having found any interest in the, par the empty parking lot where Spinoza's house presumably had stood the, some years back. Now, and with the Belgium-Hungary rally, we, uh, we rented a car and, uh, and had planned on reaching uh, Hungary in three days. Our first stop was Munich, and on John's advice, we headed to the Alte Pinacotec. What a wonderful museum. You see the Virgin and the Child from Leonardo, the only family from Raphael, or Durer self-portrait is worth the visit any time, if only for these paintings. Thank you, John, for this introduction. We also wanted to see operas. And in principle, the other idea was to try to go to the Bayerish Stadthopper. 
Unfortunately, there were no performances on that day, and we settled for a beer garden, where John, thinking he would get a small beer, asked for a piccolo. It is German. He got a glass of champagne. I managed to get a beer. The next day, we reached Vienna. Same pattern for this other lightning visit. We headed for the Kunsthistorisches Museum with its world largest collection of paintings by Peter Bruegel the Elder, in particular, that John knew about. A memorable experience, even if too brief. Then amazingly, we managed to get tickets for the Vienna State Opera. Two parts. La Traviata was playing. John was not too excited by the program, having the opinion that of all the Italian operas, only La Bonne was worth of indulging. Trying to reach the opera, second point, trying to reach the opera house. With our jackets on, we were late and got lost. Remember that there were no Google Maps in those days. So unable to sort out the maze of one-way streets near the theater, we jumped the car somewhere and started to run. We made quite an entry in this former theater, gaining our seats full of perspiration just as the orchestra was starting to play the first notes of the overture. It proved to be a remarkable performance that I think changed John's opinion of Verdi. We finished the evening with a torte at the Sacre Hotel, of course, and after that, we arrived in Hungary, connected with the Strasburger, and did the grand tour. Lake Balaton, Pesh, Seged, Debrecen, Tokar, and Budapest, of course. It was clearly making John very happy to show his country of origin. He made us taste the wines from around the lake and, in, and instructed us about the Putanos, well, I cannot say it, in the caves of Tokar. In, the, in Budapest, he made us taste the Palinka, the Gundo Cafe, Patisserie, and of course, made sure we listened to gypsy music at the Matthias Pinching. Thank you, John, for this unforgettable memories. I think we're in the last part. Uh, around 82, the federal government established the University Research Fellow Program to alleviate the drought in academic posts that was afflicting Canada. People such, such as Ivan Seto, Berniki, Cameron, myself could benefit from it. Unfortunately, this was not accessible to John since only individuals that had obtained a PhD no more than five years before were eligible. In 1984, though, uh, through the intervention of Robert Langlands, I think, the sun started to shine for John with respect to jobs. Indeed, he was invited to be a member of the School of Mathematics of the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton for the full year. He then spent the next year as associate professor at the Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken, New Jersey. This was not ideal, and with the help of Marcel Peru, he returned to Montreal in 86 as associate professor at Polytechnique Montréal, before he was finally appointed full professor in 89 in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics at Concordia University, where he has contributed and done much to building a top mathematical physics group. Moreover, every year between 86 and 91, much to his liking, John spent most of his summer summers in Princeton. We never really worked together after I came back from MIT. I was busy teaching and developing the, the theory group of the physics department. In 93, I returned to the CRM, but somehow we seemed to be a bit out of phase. For example, I worked on McDonald's polynomials and the connection between algebraic, combinatorics, and integrable models in the mid 90s, while John focused more on these objects in his recent work on quantum Hurwitz number. We should have connected more, though, and it is not because John did not propose problems, but somehow I got myself busy taking care of organization and unable to find the required time. My loss. I was inspired and inspiring. Alone and in collaboration with colleagues, students, and postdocs, John developed an impressive body of work that will long be celebrated and that will have a lasting influence. He rightfully should take pride in the book entitled Tile Functions and Their Applications, written in collaboration with Ferenc Ballard and recently published in 2021. I, I, I did not write it, that brings together many of his contributions. I always have been amazed by how he sees things very quickly in abstract terms instead of proceedings from examples. The explanation could be in John's own introspection. In an interview that you see there, he gave um, when he received the CAP CRM prize, he said, My curiosity is motivated by physics. 
But my creative ability seems to be more along the mathematical lines. And he adds, my brain tends to function like that of a mathematician, but my heart is that of a physicist. I, I hope mathematician will get offended. Uh, so one way or the other, from the brain or from the heart, he gave us a lot. John, undoubtedly, is an emblematic figure of the Montreal Mathematical Physics Group. Anyone who has given a seminar in the CIM series will have experience the breadth of his knowledge and the sharpness of his mind. I hope my story could put in light how he became the accomplished scientist and the man he is. Someone with superb intellect and inventivity who showed perseverance, passion, and hard work, and who continues to chisel scientific gems, never stopping to care for his friends and his colleagues. John, congratulations and heartfelt, heartfelt thanks. And you see the caring man with his two grandchildren in these pictures. Revel, John. Okay, I, can I can I move to? Uh, it's gonna take like one. Minute. Okay. Well, later, and you'll uh, Thank you very much for coming. And uh, you might just have to take a mic. Did you hear what I said? No, I don't think so. Okay, I'm going to repeat. You see a, a hand in the lower right hand corner. That's mine. Oh, you know what? Oh, I see it. Oh, yeah. Oh, very good. Okay, I just want to welcome all of the people I see who are connected by Zoom. And that starts, I see Steve Schneider. Welcome, Steve. We've spoken recently. And uh, Sasha Itz and Leonid Chekhov, thank you very much for coming. Rinat, Kedem, Guillaume Chapri, and Vitaly Tarasov. I think those are the only names I see, but I appreciate it very much that you, you're participating. And there's Sasha, amazing. Yeah, you, overcame, you overcame all barriers to make me present. I'm astounded. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I don't know if uh, I see any. I think that's all. Thank you very much. You keep keep, keep going because we we need oh, to. Okay. Well, let's keep chatting. <laughs> yeah. Well, but this is in the middle of the seminar, so I'm just filling in time. <laughs> so there, I don't know if the people on Zoom can see the audience. Yeah, yeah, you see the audience, of course. Great. So there's quite a turnout. I'm, I'm astounded that so many people have come in person, and I really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, also the rest of you who are all over the world, France, U.S., uh, I'm not sure where else, but uh, uh, it's great to have you with us. And it's sort of like a panorama because you're all friends and uh, many of you colleagues and collaborators. And so I hope you enjoy the week. And I want to also express my appreciation to Luke for his beautiful presentation. I'm amazed you remember all that. It was, and I had a, a longer version, which I <laughs> turned down, so there's more memories to recall. Yeah, yeah. Ah, it's uh, unforgettable, John. Okay, I'm going to sign off. Okay, and let you continue. Oops. Oops. Okay. Avec vos notes. Voilà. Okay. On va juste glisser ça ici. Et là, tout le monde All right. So we we change gear. It will. I will have to compress uh, in the interest of time. But I'll say. I'll tell you a few words about 
generalization of association schemes. I'll tell you more, the title, you see the title, but I'll explain that. Work done with two of my students, Pierre-Antoine Bernard and Mary Zaimi, and two French colleagues, Nicolas Crampé and Loïc Poulain-Dandessy. The goal is to replace, you know, in the definition in, of certain classes of association scheme, they're called P polynomial. And the goal is to generalize those by replacing where ordinary univariate polynomials occur, to replace them by bivariate, eventually multivariate. Now, association schemes are, can be defined like this. So I'll go through the definition in case you've not seen it. So you have a set of objects uh, which we'll think for the purpose of the definition as being as adjacency matrices, the AI. And you say the scheme is, so the, is a symmetric association scheme with N classes. So you see it goes from A0 to AN. If these, these are adjacency matrix, so A0 is one, they sum to the O1 matrix, they are symmetric, and they obey this relation which defines the Bose-Messner algebra. So namely, if you take the product of these commuting matrices, AI, AJ, you can expand it in a linear combination of all the other matrices using these P, I, J, K, which are the intersection numbers. These things, uh, I don't have much time to motivate that. They occur, they were introduced first in statistics. They are some the cornerstone of much of algebraic, uh, you know, combinatorics, certainly if, if you view the adjacency matrix matrices as defining graphs, so there's a lot of graph theory underneath that. Of late, I like to put fermions on the graphs of these association schemes and look for the entanglement properties of those. We, we can do a lot, but these are huge. Uh, it's a huge class of mathematical object and their classification is far from complete. As I was saying, a class on which we can say much more is the class of the P polynomial scheme. What happens then? Well, the, these adjacency matrices AI can be written as a polynomial VI of one, of A1. VI would be a polynomial of degree I. And in that case, in fact, you, you can see that these AI will be adjacency matrices of distance regular graph. And if you work out the dual picture, uh, you have the notion of Q polynomial also, and these, the P and Q polynomial association schemes have been classified and they are in correspondence with the families uh, of polynomials of the ASCII scheme. So as I said, the goal is to replace this V in P polynomial scheme by a V, which is bivariate, depends on two variable, and we'll move to defining the bivariate P polynomial association scheme. I'll try to sketch the definition, and then I'll briefly show you that many of the examples of uh, association schemes of higher rank that we know fit the definition that I will have given. So if this will be, you know, I have, I should stop in 10 minutes. So I'll go quickly, but I'll try to give you just a feel for, for what is there. So we, we're dealing with polynomials in two variables. So uh, of course, uh, we need to define some orders. There's the lexicographic order, which is fairly straightforward. Of course, if the total degree, so you have degrees M and M, I and J, it should be a J. If the total degree of one is, uh, the sum is less than the other sum, then you order them accordingly. If the, the degrees are the same, you pick the, the last degree to determine the order. And then you say that the degree of the polynomial is given by the pair ij, such that all the other monomials occurring in the polynomial have a lower degree. What is key in the definitions I, I will give is the, the following partial order. So this I should not go too quickly. You introduce two parameters, alpha and beta. And uh, you say that monomials are ordered with respect to this partial order of type alpha, beta, if you have these two conditions. So you see, you introduce the alpha in front of the n here, and j, and beta 
arises there. Just to give examples, of course, uh, if alpha and beta is zero, well, you just require that you know m is smaller than n, so it's the rectangular. Uh, the what is shaded indicates uh, in the uh, in the plane in the discrete plane what what are the uh, points that fall that are uh, smaller than the i and j. But if you pick alpha is equal to zero, well, the, the zero will still give you a, a rectangular type of uh, constraint. But you you will have to for, for in the uh, you will also be behind the slope with uh, the the line with slope minus a half in that case. And you have other examples for the one zero where you'll change. It will be the same type of trapeze shape, but you will sh change the slope. And if you have the case one half, one half, well, you have a slope of uh, minus a half and a slope of minus two, right? So you, you, you see that it will define different domains in, the, uh, um, in that plane. Okay. Now, we say that a polynomial is alpha beta compatible of the degree ij if all if ij of course appears and all the other monomials are lower than I, ij in in that order and you then define that the domain is alpha beta compatible if it the, the fact that a monomial would be smaller if, if so if you have an ij in the domain the fact that the, you will see that the domain is alpha beta compatible if the fact that a monomial mn is smaller than ij with ij in the domain implies that all the mn are in the domain and and then the, the definition that counts is that the so we will say that the association scheme z the set of uh, adjacency matrix is bivariate p polynomial of type alpha beta on the domain d if these Adjacency matrix, well, you can relabel them from A0 to AN. You go to, you relabel re that to have AMN with the MN belonging to the domain, and such that for IJ in that domain, these adjacency matrices are expressed as a two variable polynomial VIJ of A10 and A01 um, with the polynomial being alpha beta compatible. And the second point is that the domain has to be alpha beta compatible. Yeah. Well, there's some consequences that you can draw from that. They're fairly straightforward. Basically, uh, well, what is important is that the cardinality of the domain has to correspond to the, the number of adjacency matrices that you have. Well, I, I will skip, I will just give you a, an overview. So it's easy to see that uh, with these properties, such uh, with all the elements of the definition, that such a polynomial is unique. It's just a linear combination, a linear algebra argument. And then there's a something which is also easy to show, a technical argument is that if I lower uh, one degree by one and x with the variable act with the variable x and similarly y, I will get a combination uh, of the polynomial where, where the degrees are lower in alpha beta to ij. It's not too complicated to, uh, to believe that. The, the important point is that it's well known that uh, this condition for ordinary p polynomial scheme, the definition implies a metric condition on the intersection number. Namely, well, you, you have the obvious one, uh, but the, these intersection numbers will be non zero if k here is between i minus j in absolute value and i plus j. This is what makes the equivalence between p polynomial scheme and distance regular graphs. Okay, it's this property that it's not so difficult to show. Well, we can obtain a similar uh, similar type of restrictions 
and the intersection number in these bivariate p polynomial schemes. And here, so we denote now we use these two, these double integer indices, i, j, k, l. And so this occurs in the intersection number. And there's a third one, mn. So, okay. So those are the intersection number. And you can show the equivalence with the notion of being bivariate p polynomial with these uh, restriction on the um, intersection numbers. If one takes a, um, a minute to look at one. So, of course, you need to distinguish. Now you have two variables. So you distinguish one, zero, and zero, one as for one entry. And you look at where you can go, where the expansion can go. And it's expressed by these two inequalities in, in the alpha beta sense. Not necessary to pay attention, but once you have these restrictions, you can work them out. So the proof, again, not so complicated, and you can work them out depending on the choice of alpha and beta. So this, in this diagram, the one above would correspond to the intersection numbers with where one entry is one zero, and the one below is where one entry is zero one. And of course, if you pick that alpha and beta are zero, it's basically a direct product, as I'll see. And so you have a tree term in one variable and a tree term in the other variable. But the once you start modifying the parameters, uh, you you see that you will have recurrence relations that will get that will have will be higher order. So for instance, this would amount three in one variable, but this would be a five point recurrence relation. And things get more complicated uh, as you as you go on. I hope I'm making a little bit of sense. Now the constraints on the intersection number they they determine. The, the, what these products are in terms of uh, linear expansion in terms of these adjacency matrix. So they give you the recurrence relations, right, of the uh, bivariate polynomial, like you, you see here. If I multiply, you re replace Vij by Aij. If you replace the variable by, uh, by the uh, adjacency matrices and you read off from the analysis of these constraints, what the recurrence relations would be. So the case one half zero is here. So you have one, which is three term, but the other, which is five term. Now, uh, maybe I will skip that. So, so of course, these all these matrices are commute. So they can all be simult simultaneously diagonalized. So you can use Idempotence, so as the projector on the eigenspaces, so you, you know, there's a dual description of the scheme. Uh, but if you, having diagonalized the, the the matrices, if you call the eigenvalues of a one zero theta and the eigenvalues of zero one mu m n, you can find that the eigenvalues of all these matrices, once you project them on the uh, projectors on the eigenspaces, will be given through this polynomials VI, VIJ, of the eigenvalues of A10 and of A01. Two, two minutes on examples, I apologize. So there's a trivial example to get a bivariate scheme. You just take the product, the direct product of two P polynomial schemes. I won't dwell into that. It's, it's, it's very ob obvious. A more interesting example is if you take the uh, strongly regular graphs, which are equivalent to association schemes with uh, two classes. And you work it out so you can determine what are the intersection numbers in that case. And uh, from there, you can do something called symmetrization. So you form this object with uh, uh, abstract parameters x1 and x2. You take the n tensor product. You define the aij adjacency matrix to this uh, symmetric product. And uh, lo and behold, after symmetrization, you have an explicit expressions for these uh, uh, adjacency matrices. And they form 
they form a, a, a p polynomial scheme because a direct computation gives you the recurrence relation. And in that case, you, you find that you see you have five term recurrence relations in, in the two cases. No, uh, yes. And so if you just draw the picture, you see that it would look like this. And uh, so this would be a one half, one half scheme. I will skip. So then you can look at other interesting uh, situation. There's something that generalize, you know, there, there are very, two very famous, famous schemes. It's the Hamming scheme and the Johnson scheme. The Hamming scheme would then, its generalization would be a special case of what I just described. You pick these parameters uh, and then you understand, you can also understand the connection with bivariate polynomials that arise through the eigen matrices. Uh, and then there's a similar generalization of the Johnson scheme, which can be defined and uh, I think I'll leave it to that. If, so once you've defined the scheme, you will, can work out the recurrence relation. And uh, as you work your way, you find that you get something else. And the, the picture is like this. So you get the three-term recurrence relation. And in this case, you get a seven-term recurrence relation. The polynomials associated to that scheme are interesting. They're made out of uh, Kraftschuk, univariate Kraftschuk polynomials. and uh, um, univariate Han, dual Han polynomials. And so this provides the recurrence relation. I'll go to the, there are other, you can also look at generalization of dual polar scheme, where you look at subspaces built on finite fields. These are also interesting situations where you see Q polynomials occurring in the description. Uh, so just to what to take home. Uh, what we could do is provide an interesting, I think, uh, definition of bivariate p polynomial association schemes of type alpha beta. We found that many um, existing uh, examples fit within the definition. Uh, it would be, we, I did not tell you about q polynomial scheme, but this is a, an open question which we st should study more. And there's also something of interest called the Terwilliger algebras in association scheme. Would be interesting to look into that and to try to generalize a notion of Leonard pairs that is in correspondence with uh, the ASCII scheme. What happens in the case of uh, more dimensions? Sorry if this was rushed, but the, I allocated my time to the most important topic. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any Thank questions? You. Thank you. Yes. Oh, of course. These recurrence relations related are translated into. Does anybody? Well, so you can work out. Yes, you can work out generally generating functions for these polynomials. Uh, so, in a sense, they do, but... Uh, is this generating function in the main class for the first time? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I, I was writing one for, for the, the Hamming scheme or the, this, the, you know, in a sense, what I call J, A0 plus XA1 plus uh, two to the power N. This was the generating function in that case. So, these are... Uh, in, in that most well-known and simple case, mm -hmm. th th this is known, yes. Yeah. So uh, uh, you mentioned Leonard Bors in the end. So Leonard Bors condition where you have two bases and two operators and one is so they have mm -hmm. and they have right. So mm -hmm. what would replace this condition? Well, um, so you, you need to write to, because you're working in two variables, you would uh, consider, uh, so one way to think about it, the, the simplest way is if you have the polynomials, you look at the recurrence relation and you look at the difference relation. And so in, if you uh, work with the recurrence relation, 
this will be a diagonal and you will have the three term uh, operator. <laughs> now, uh, the, these, you saw these polynomials. Sometimes they could be, say, five term and seven term. So you, this would be, and you, you have two because you have two recurrence relations, two difference relations, and you need to look at the algebra that this would generate. It's, I think, a rather interesting question. For the Hamming scheme, the Terwilliger algebra, there is known. It's a, it's a Lie algebra. It's SU2, and the extension to, to higher rank will be SUM, but it no longer remains a Lie algebra once you go to other schemes. And so it's, it's an open question, really. Uh, I think I'm sorry. I have another one. Uh, so when you say that uh, in one of your examples, uh, polynomials is where it knows are made out of uh, Kravchuk and, and Han. So do we think about this as like the wire covenant level and the corresponding spectral letter is made of somehow hooked out of the ghost or uh, yeah, yeah, they the uh, it's like the bivariate Kravchuk polynomials uh of one type well, good, but it's an you know intertwined, it can be constructed out of two um univariate capture polynomials, but where they are quite intertwined because the degree of one will become the variable of the other. So you, they're certainly not written as a direct product, which is uh, rather trivial. And uh, and then, yes, you, you have all the characterization of these polynomials that are relevant to, to the work here. Yeah. Okay. You want to hear Percy, you shouldn't get late. But the yes, no, you should move on. Uh, John, you had a question. No, just a trivial question, but I don't want to take up. We're, go, we're running behind. Right? Uh, we're just, just on time. Okay. You said that for each pair alpha beta, there's a unique polynomial relation yes. between X and Y. Yeah. How unique? I mean, is it, do you know, can you actually compute the coefficients? Are they algebraic? For instance? Well, how do they depend on alpha beta? Oh, that, that, that is, uh, I, that I don't know. I don't have the explicit, I, I know that there will not be, you know, if I define it, there's not another one which is different with the conditions that I've given. You don't know if they're algebraic functions or no. polynomials or no. that? Well, no, 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 no. They are, uh, they are algebraic because they obey these recurrence relation. So the, the difficulty is to compute for a given scheme what I don't know are the intersection uh, numbers. So I don't know the recurrence uh, coefficient. So the dependence on alpha, beta, where uh, that is difficult because the intersection numbers, they will depend on these alpha, beta. But I know that they are polynomial just from the fact that they satisfy these uh, recurrence relations. So formally, I, I can see what they will look like, but explicitly in terms of alpha and beta, we could do in the we we have the expression in those cases, but not all. So, for instance, the uh, the one there's a scheme based on attenuated spaces, and it's quite difficult to compute just the intersection numbers. So, even though the scheme is defined. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.